Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, today, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Mingwei Cheng from Univers University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, to visit us. Uh, Mr. Cheng is a student of uh, Professor Dan Roth, who is very well known in the machine learning and NLP area. And last, last month when I visited UIUC, uh, Ms. Cheng's work was uh, highly uh, uh, touted as one of the uh, most proud outcomes from his lab. And as such, the, uh, Mr. Chen will be giving an invited talk uh, later next month in the uh, special workshop. So it's very uh, nice that he can stop by today and give us a preview of, of what he's going to, uh, to talk about. So without further ado, take over. And thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ming Wei. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, structure prediction with indirect supervision. So everybody can hear me, right? Good. Uh, so uh, first, I'm going to talk about the motivation. So what is indirect supervision and why? And then we're going to talk about uh, other parts of uh, the talk. So the first, so we, as a computer scientist, we all dream one day we can uh, communicate with machines. So for example, you ask machine, I like a coffee with no sugar and just a little milk. So one way uh, to communicate with machines is that if we can translate human requests into some mini representations. So for example, make coffee, sugar equal to zero, milk equal to 0 0.3. And then the machine can understand your comment and maybe the machine can do something for you. So for example, maybe Wally will come here and make a cup of coffee for you. Okay. So the, the, the thing is that we need a translator to help you to translate a human request into mini representations. So how do we do that? So the, the common, um, the usual way to do this is to build a supervised uh, learning model. So for example, in the training time, you have uh, a lot of pairs of text and mini representations. So you hire some annotator for some uh, human request and the corresponding mini representation. You collect a lot of those pairs. Then you feed this training data into the training algorithm. Then you will obtain a model such that in the testing time, when you see a human request, you can translate this into some mini representations. Okay. So what's the problem of this approach? The problem is that labeling the data is very expensive, especially in this case. The annotator needs to know how to translate the human um, um, request into some mini representation, and this is not easy. So the question we are trying to ask is, can we build this model, can we train this model with other types of information? Uh, so for example, so let's say um, you drink this cup of coffee and you tell Wally, is it is a good cup of coffee or a bad cup of coffee? So this response doesn't tell you the mini representation directly, but it contains some information about the mini representations. So the question we are going to ask here is, can we use responses as a supervision signal to improve the statistical model? Okay, that's the first example. So the second example is, uh, um, constraints. So let's say you, right now you want to move to some place and uh, you want to rent an apartment. So you go to Craigslist and there's a post that two bedroom condo, garage and a new oven stove, blah blah. And you want to know that um, the first three words is uh, tell you about the size of this apartment and then the following five words are talking about the, the future of this apartment, then followed by the size of apartment again, followed by the neighborhood of this apartment, followed by the contact information of this post. Okay, so you want to build a machine learning classifier that tell you this information. Uh, so by the way, if you are really into this condo, don't call this number because this is my cell phone number. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you build an HMI model and then you, 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 <laughs> you predict um, this post probably you will, you will get something like this. So is this correct? The answer is no. Why? Because as a human, we can immediately point out something wrong here. So you should then stop at uh, some word which is not um, uh, you meaningful. So basically, you ignore the punctuation as a clue of a state transition. You should only switch state at the punctuation marks. 
Okay, and there are other simple constraints. For example, phone number should belong to contact. So we all know that if we can enforce this constraint when you predict the output, it is likely you will uh, make the predictions better. But the question we are going to ask here is different. We are going to ask, can we use constraint to improve the model? Uh, so here's the motivation. So here is the diagram of the usual supervised training algorithm. You have a, a label data. You go to the uh, training algorithm, then you build a model. So what's the problem of this approach is that this is, this is a time-consuming and, and uh, expensive process. And it is worse for structural prediction where you have many decisions to make. So for example, in um, mini representation tasks, you need to know the first word map to this uh, comment and the second word to another comment. And it does not use existing knowledge. And it does do not use related label data. So the motivation of today's talk is we want to find some way that we can accept other forms of supervision. We want to develop a, a principal machine learning approach that can accept other forms of supervision, such that we are not limited to only label data. And why? Another reason is we want to reduce the supervision effort. So this is one of the major challenges in NLP because there are many, many new interesting applications are not explored and there are many languages. So because the reason we don't explore those ex applications is because we don't have enough supervision. So I know many of you are machine learning experts. So we all know we already have some, some way we can counter this problem. For example, we have a supervised learning algorithm we have unsupervised learning algorithm where you just input uh, X and you fit into a training algorithm and then you build a model. You have semi-supervised learning algorithms. So why, why are we here? So the problem is that um, if you list all of these three learning frameworks, you will find they have already made an assumption where the supervision only equal to label data. Right? So when you say this is an unsupervised learning algorithm, which means you didn't use any label data, but that's not true because the supervision does not only equal to label data. Some other information can only be uh, supervision. So the main idea of today's talk is we want to learn with indirect supervision. So besides the labeled examples and unlabeled example, we want to use something else. That's what we call indirect supervision. So what is indirect supervision is the rough definition is the supervision form that, that does not tell you the target output directly. So for example, in the response, in the mini representation example, the response doesn't tell you the mini representation directly. But somehow it carries some information about your, your output. The constraint doesn't tell you the target output directly. The constraint doesn't tell you the three word is, the first three word is, is um, size and then followed by the feature. But the constraint tells you something about the, what the target output should look like. So the advantage of using indirect supervision is we can directly use human domain knowledge to improve the model. Uh, it allows us to use supervision signals that are a lot easier to obtain and using existing label data, and it can be combined with semi-supervised learning. So I hope after today's talk, you'll be convinced that uh, you can use some indirect supervision in your application and it can help you to reduce the supervision effort. So another reason is because uh, of this. <laughs> so this is my three months old daughter. And obviously, she is trying to say something. Okay? And uh, <laughs> so the scientific challenge here is that people learn to speak not with direct supervision. So my wife tried to uh, teach my daughter to say something. You, we, he, she used uh, visual clue and uh, feedback interaction with, the, with my daughter. We didn't give you 1,000 sentences and label data and hope that she will speak automatically. Okay, so how many of you are familiar with structure output predictions? Okay, so good. So let's go over this very quick. So um, um, given an example, a binary classification problem is that given an example, you want to know if this is a positive example or a negative example. So for example, a span filtering. This is a span or not a span. Okay, the structure output prediction is different. You want to choose one structure from all possible ones. So there are two characteristics. The first one is that uh, in one example, there are multiple interdependent decisions. And the second, um, the second characteristic is uh, usually you have exponential number of structures. So for example, uh, let's make the adver advertisement post here. You have two bedroom condo garage 
and this is your input. You can think this is a an hidden Markov model. And then, so you have uh, exponential number of output. So first, for example, you can say everything is neighbor, or the first one is feature and followed by the neighbors. And the correct output is also among the exponential number of structures. So in order to build a model, you need to have a, a capability to find out the best structure among the exponential number of structures. So this is a review. And this is a notation. So we annotate, we notate, um, we denote input as x, uh, output as h, structure as h. And our training model is w, which is basically a linear model. So basically, um, we assume there's a feature vector between input and output space. And the idea is we are going to have a scoring function between each input and output. And the scoring function is simply the dot product between w and the feature vector. And as I say, in the testing time, you need to be able to pick the best structure among exponential number of structures. And this is a mathematic way of doing that. So you want to pick the best structures among all possible structures such that the score is maximized. OK? OK, so you can think this is, uh, you can think this is an HNN or a, a CIF. Okay, so we just I just finished the motivation, and I'm going to talk about uh, constraint-driven learning very fast. Then we're going to talk about how can we learn uh, semantic classifier with constraint on latent variables, and how can we use binary label data as indirect provision for structural output predictions, and uh, how can we use response to learn the mini representation. That's the, the final part. Okay, let's go to constraint-driven learning. So you have a constraint. We want to see if we can we use constraint to improve the model, OK? So the, the, how do you combine constraint with HMN? So one easy thing is that, is that when you make predictions, you just disallow the assignment that violate constraint to appear. So basically, you penalize the assignments that violate constraint. OK, so think about a, a model. You have a model, like, like an HMN model. So the semi-supervised learning algorithm usually, uh, you know, can be expressed in this diagram. You have a model, and you label the unlabeled data. After you got a newly labeled data, you got a new, new data, and you flip back to your model to retrain your model. So you got an improved model, then you do this uh, iteratively until it converges. So for example, EN, self-training, and other algorithms can be, can be flowed into these diagrams. So the question here is, where do you get the constraints? Do you think you are given the constraints, or you want to learn the constraints? Oh, we are given the constraints. The human given constraint, give, give us a constraint, okay. So the idea of constraint driven learning is very, very simple, is after we have constraint, we just put constraint into this cycle, okay? So after you have constraints, you will get a better label data. But the point is, because after you get a label data, you get better feedback for your model, so your model will get better, okay? So that's why constraint can help to you to improve your model. And the whole process, this is not ad hoc, the whole process can be cast as an optimization procedure. Okay, so here is the result. I show this result just to show, to make sure that you understand, please. Can you go back to the slide? Sure, just so I understand. So the learning part, the feedback into the model, at that point when you're updating the model, you ignore the constraints? Right. So, um, so this is uh, the advertisement data set. So if you just use an HMM model with uh, uh, EN, and you got 60.75 accuracy. If you have constraint, and you train and test with constraint, you can get 70.79, so you get big improvement. But if you take away the constraint in the testing time, so basically you, you go back to an HMM model, but you put, because the constraint uh, populated information uh, during this learning process, so you got a better HMM model, and your HMM model is in fact better than your original one. So what's the, what's the, what's the unit Pardon? Accuracy. 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 Token-based accuracy. Uh, what, what's the accuracy that you classify correctly? This will carry the information of size or the feature of a neighborhood of the, of the apartment. And uh, when we publish the, the, this paper, <laughs> with our number is uh, one of the best. So if you use all the data, you get 82. And um, here is a new result on we did today, uh, this year not today, and as on domain adaptation. So you have some state-of-the-art NLP tools, but the problem is that when you apply on other domains, usually you, get, you, you suffer from domain difference and you got better results. So this is a known problem, very important problem. So the, the, 
the, the way we're going to solve this is when we're going to read the annotation guideline. So, so we have a possibly take data in the news domain, and we have possibly take data in the biomedical domain. And it so happened on the web, there's the annotation guideline for the possibly data on the medical domain. We just read that annotation guideline, and we translate the annotation guideline into constraints. Um, so this is the baseline of the state-of-the-art tool. So this is 86.2. Uh, this is another test, semantic role labeling. And you got 58.6. Okay, on a new domain. After you're adding constraint, you are already getting a lot better. But you can also feed back into the constraint into your learning process, and you can get even better result. Okay, so the idea is that you, we can use constraints as an indirect solution to improve your model. And it is help not only for small data set, but also for the large data set if you, you want to apply this technique to a new domain. And there are many recent work that adopt similar ideas. So uh, McCollum in UMass uh, and uh, Tasca in 2000, uh, 2007, 2010 has a paper. So basically, there's a tutorial on <laughs> ACL this year talking about similar ideas. And they have applied idea on dependence passing, word alignment, and document classifications. And there's also a project in CMU called NAIL, Never Ending Learning. So where they want to try to do web scale information extractions. So basically, they want to know from reading the web that Michael Jordan is a player for Chicago Bulls. Okay, so the, they do that and they found out if they don't put constraint in their bootstrap learning procedure, their result is a lot worse. So they claim it is necessary to put constraint into their, their learning process. Okay, so I just finished constraint-driven learning, and I'm going to jump to a second, a little bit unrelated uh, the task, but I'm going to jump back to the structure of upper predictions. So let's say we are trying to learn a deep semantic classifier. What do I say, what do I mean by a deep learning semantic classifier? Is a paraphrase identification. So let's say you have two sentences. The first sentence is, Ellen will first face murder charges, Bob said. And the second sentence is, Bob said Ellen will be charged with murder. So the question is, are these two sentences paraphrase, paraphrases of each other? And the answer is yes, but why? You know the answer is yes because you know you form an alignment internally in your brain such that you know the first sentence, the information in the first sentence has been carried by the second sentence and vice versa, right? So in order to make this decision, you need to have an intermediate representation for this problem, okay? And this is just an example. The real uh, intermediate representation is a lot more complicated. But now just think the intermediate representation is an alignment, okay? So the problem of interest here is we want to do binary classification output. So we want to say yes or no. But we need some intermediate representations and it requires some structure that justify the label. Okay, so one important thing is that in the training data in, and in the testing data, unfortunately, you don't have an intermediate representation. All you have is two sentences and the answer is yes or no. Okay, so they are latent. So uh, I just talked about two types of problem. The first one is structure output learning. So input is X, output is the structures. And the second type now is the input is X, output is a binary, but you need require some hidden structures. So I promise you I will go back to the structure output prediction, but let's stay on this problem for a second. Okay, so how do people you, right now handle these paraphrase identification problems. Basically, they use a two-stage approach. In a stage one, people generate uh, intermediate representations. So we obtain the intermediate representation, then they fix it, okay? Maybe you use some heuristic, maybe use some other model. And in the second stage, you just use a build a model based, to extract, based on the feature you extract from your input and intermediate representations. So once you fix the fir first stage, basically the second stage is a classical uh, machine learning binary classification problem. Okay, uh, but the problem is that you don't know if the intermediate representation you choose is good for the second stage or not, right? Maybe you come up with some alignment, but maybe that alignment is not good for, the, for, the, for the, your binary classifications. So uh, we want to fix that. And the second problem is that um, if you want to apply the same framework into three different problems, you need to have a three different procedures that are finding the intermediate representation, and you want to have a unified framework to do that. So our framework called LCOR, but it's just a name, 
is we want to jointly learn the intermediate representations and labels. So for example, the first, uh, the, we have input, x is the input, h is the intermediate representations, these are the features, and z is the binary labels. We want to see if we can use the binary output to label, to feedback, to see if we can find a better intermediate representation for the output. Okay, finding the representation for the, for the output. And the second property is that we want to use a constraint-based inference for intermediate representation. So basically, we want to make it easy to inject knowledge for the latent variables and easy to generalize to other tasks. OK, so this is probably one of the most important slides uh, here. So let's go slow here. So I keep to talking to you that uh, we should do a joint learning between the intermediate representation and the binary output. But who said that is? A, a, a good approach, right? So here is the justification, the intuition. So let's talk about this example. This is a paraphrase identification. You have two sentences, and you want to know if they are paraphrases of each other. And only positive examples have good intermediate representations. Why? Because only if they are paraphrases of each other, you know you have, they have alignment that, carry, that makes sure that they carry the same information. And if they are not, uh, preference of each other. You cannot find an alignment that give, that, that, that's justified that they, they carry the same information. Right? So there is a connection between the output and the intermediate representation. So we want to formalize this idea. So let's say x is the sentence pair. h is the structural alignment between these two sentences. And the weight vector is w. Okay. So let's say you have two sentence pair. Okay. The first one is Positive. The second one is negative. Okay, so I say if these two sentences are paraphrases of each other, there must exist a good explanation that justifies the positive label. And if they are not, then no explanation is good enough to justify the positive label. Okay, okay. So how how do we formulate this idea? Is that we say exists an alignment such that the score is good enough. And here is. No explanation is good enough. So no matter what alignment you try, the score is not going to be good enough. OK, any problems here? OK, so, okay, so I just copied the information from the last page to here. Let's see what does it mean on the hyperplane and geometrical interpretation. So, um, so we all know uh, in the classical binary classification problem, you have one point that is positive. One point is negative. You just draw a hyperplane, says, OK, this is a good hyperplane because it separates the positive example from the negative example. Okay. But it is not the case here because our feature vector is over the input and the, the hidden variable. But we don't know what is the hidden variable. So basically, because we don't know what is hidden variables, we just put all possible hidden variables here. So this is a sentence. We just put all possible alignment here, and this is the a feature set of all possible alignment. Okay? And we can do the same thing for the negative data. So we just put a, a, a set. So for the second example, we put for all possible alignment. For each alignment, we put the point in the hyperplane, and they will form a set. Okay? So I'm going to claim this is a good weight vector because this implements the intuition there. Why is that? So we, when we look at a positive example, we say there must exist one point that is on the positive side, right? So we know I can find one point, one blue point on the positive side. So this is good. So for the uh, red constraint, I say all of the points need to be on the negative side. And all the points is on the negative side here. So that's why we also satisfy the, the second constraint. So this weight vector helped us to uh, implement the, the intuition we, we mentioned in the last slide. But if, if you want to verify in this way, you need to go over all past points in the set. But in fact, you don't need to do that. All you need to do is to find out the, the best point here. So this is the best point because this is the farthest point along this direction because the weight vector is toward to here. So this is the point point, and we, want, we only need to know this point is on the positive side. Because exists a point on the positive side is equivalent to say the best point is on the positive side. And uh, for all points on the negative side, it's equivalent to say the best point is on the negative side. So for the negative example, we only need to check this point, and we only need to see they are on the negative side. So I say a lot, but what I really want to say is the final sentence. 
So although we are trying to do a binary classification task, but in this problem, in order to make a prediction, you first need to find out the best structures, the best alignment, then you see if this alignment is good enough or not then to make your final predictions. So it's kind of a weird, weird comparison. You are doing a binary classification, but you need to find a structure because in order to make these predictions. So any problems here? Okay, so we also use the, in, uh, the integer linear programming here, and the importance is to generalize to other tests. So in the experiment, we used one, one, um, one learning framework and one inference framework. So all we do is we replace different, uh, for different problems, we replace the problem with different constraints and different features. So basically, what we're trying to do is that you have a declarative framework. So you define your problem into using constraints and features. Then you plug into this learning framework, and we will generate a, a weight vector for you. I'm going to skip these details. And let's, sure. Maybe I'm just having trouble digesting this. But, um, so you've made this, this decision that the alignment between the two sentences are a good signal of, of them being paraphrases. Right. Right. There could be others, right? So you could look at like a grammatical, like a parse, and, and make sure that the parse is aligned or something like no, that. No, no. In fact, we are, what we are trying to do is the parse is aligned. So, uh, so I, I guess what I'm saying is there, there's all these different potential structures that you can be looking for the best particular one. Right. And don't people today, um, generate these different kinds of hypotheses and use those as features for the binary um, yeah. decision task. Wait, the, how, pro the problem is that, um, so for example, one of the, our tests is texture entailment. So for example, you want to say, um, a texture entailment is, uh, in the source sentence, you have a paragraph. And your target sentence is one short sentence. And you, and you want to know if this paragraph implies this short sentence or not. However, let's say, uh, uh, Let's say the short sentence is George Bush is smart. Okay, so but maybe in the in the uh, maybe in the source paragraph you have five sentences and they all have George Bush, and maybe some of them have smart. So then you if if you just find one alignment, you don't know if this alignment can support your final decision or not. Even though you use parsing, even though you use other information, you do uh, yeah, you do name recognition, you do everything perfectly, you still need to find a correct alignment to support your final decisions. Uh, is that clear? It's, it's not clear. Maybe it's just a so, so you made a point earlier on, I think, following up to the Patrick question, that uh, you made a, a point earlier on that uh, I think one of the uh, distinct uh, approaches you take is that you actually put some constraints in it. Yeah. And so where, it, where, is the, where are the constraints in the, uh, in the uh, paraphrasing example? Oh, okay. So I skip this one, but let's go oh, back to okay. here. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, uh, right now we are using very simple constraints, but you, we can think there are other kind of constraints. For example, you have um, right now you have a dependency tree for the first sentence and the dependency tree for the second sentence. Okay, so you're saying I'm going to not only align on the node, but also align on the on the um, dependency edge as well. Okay. Yes, okay, the, tra the, the traditional is you, you find alignment, then you just fix the alignment, then you do it, right? Now, what I'm trying to... My understanding is you would create the alignment and you'd get some kind of score from that alignment, some kind of distance, between, right. Right? right? Right. And, and you'd use that as a feature in your classification task, and you'd also use one that compares the difference between two parse tree alignments or something, right? So you'd have this collection of features from these different structures, um, and then you let the binary... Um, Okay, so you say you generate three alignment, and then they all have different score. Yeah, you could do that. Okay. Yes. Okay. So right now, what people do in this task, as far as I know, is they generate one alignment, then they just fix it. Okay. Uh, maybe they use the score of this alignment or not. I, I'm not so sure. But the problem is that my point is, once if you are commit into one alignment, there's no way to go back. Right, so, so that's the point here. The point is we want to see if there's a way we can fix the alignment. You can think this is like a supervised EN. We want to do EN, the procedure, but we want to see this EN procedure was guided by your output, not just, you know, you run EN free there. I'm not so sure if this explanation is good enough. Yeah, we can talk more later. Okay, so this is how, how do we do here. 
and uh, I'm going to do a little bit quicker here, okay, because we don't have a lot of time. So basically, um, this is how you do uh, logistic regression and support vector machines. You write down the formulation and you put a decision function there. Okay, depends on what kind of loss function you use, this can be SVN or logistic regression or something else. Okay, now, as I told you, our decision is an uh, inference process which you need to find the best structures and to see if the best structure is good enough. And so basically your decision function is in fact an uh, integer linear programming here and you want to see if the result, is, uh, the, the result of your uh, alignment is good enough or not. And you just put it here. But however, right now it's pretty complicated because inside we have a complicated inference problem. So, this is not a standard logistic regression and SVN because inside the decision function, you need to solve the max problem, okay? And uh, unfortunately, it, this also affects the features. If you choose a different alignment, you're going to generate different features and that will impact your learning result. And that's why this is not a standard logistic regression or SVN, okay? And there are many related learning frameworks. I I'll be very happy to talk about the related learning framework but I don't have time, so if you want to know about fra relative framework, I'm very happy to talk to you offline. Okay, so how do we optimize this function? This is not a logistic regression or SVN, so you cannot apply the regular package to do that. Uh, there's no shortcut. If you want to write a wrapper and code SVN multiple times, I hope you can op optimize the function. It doesn't do that. So basically, uh, our solution is an uh, optimization algorithm that do uh, EM-like procedure with other machine learning tri uh, optimization tricks. These are interesting, but not uh, uh, that important. So if you are interested, you can ask me later. And uh, uh, it's simple to implement in, in the support parallelization of inference procedure. Okay, let's talk about the experimental result. We have three tasks here. One is uh, transliteration. Is uh, the MTB a transliteration of A? A texture entailment and peripheral identifications. So we have the goal of experiment to see if our method works. That's one goal, okay? But in fact, in our framework, there are two components. One is the IOP component, and one is the um, one is the joint learning component, okay? So in order to make sure that we didn't cheat here, we use exactly the same features, exactly the same constraint for these two approach. The only difference is that in a, in a two-stage approach, we use a domain-dependent heuristic to find the alignment, and uh, our approach, uh, the AOCLR, find uh, these two intermediate representation automatically. So this is on translation on, uh, on English Hebrew data set. Um, past people got 89.4. If you just fix your alignment and then you do it, you can get uh, 85.7, but if you, you allow your alignment to move, you can get a much better result. This is a texture entailment system. You have um, the median of the text system is 61.5. Uh, our two stage is already good because I think because uh, we, we add some constraint to capture the dependency between these two sentences. And uh, our LCR is even better. 2% here is very difficult. And here is a perfect result. So here is one interesting experiment. So in order to uh, do um, the paraphrase, and if to find alignment for paraphrase, we try two different heuristics to find uh, the alignment. So WF is a scoring function that you're coming from WorldNet, and you can find alignment between, find the most similar word on the other side. And Winston is the, the scoring function that we develop in our, in our group, and is, my friend told me this is a much better uh, scoring function for this task. So if you use uh, WF, you, uh, uh, you, you fix the alignment, then you do the accuracy, you got 72.3. But if you let the learning framework allow to change, you can get a much better result. However, if you are using a very good uh, heuristic at the beginning, 63, and you got 63.2, and you can only get a little improvement here. So the point here is, if you know what's the correct alignment at the beginning, then you might not need to do this. But if you don't know, then it is a good idea to let learning algorithm to drive you a, a good alignment for your task. Okay, so this part, I'm talking about how can you focus on binary output problem with latent structures, and can we find the best latent structures for the binary problems? Okay, so here is the fourth part of the talk. 
And uh, here, I'm, we, are, I'm, I'm, we are going to move back to the structure output prediction problems. So our goal is the same, is given that supervised structure, super, supervising structures is time consuming and require expertise, how can we uh, reduce the supervision effort for structural output problems? Okay, so is it, and the recent question here is, is, is it possible to use additional cheap sources of supervision? So note, this is a structural output problem, so we are going back to structural output problems, but there's a connection, we will see it immediately. So let's say you, you have a task that given a car image, you want to know uh, where are the body, windows, and wheels. Okay, and here they are. Okay, <laughs> and there are, this is a, a structural output prediction problem because there are multiple decisions. There are wheels and their bodies, and they are interdependent because usually wheel is in the bottom of the body, usually. Okay, so you can build a supervised approach. You do some label data, you build a machine learning model. But this is expensive. So you can also use semi-supervised learning approach where you collect a lot of uh, car image, okay? And then, then you do super semi-supervised learning. But the question is, what happened to flower? Can you use flower to give you some hint or to help you to learn how to recognize car parts? Okay, this is what we call embedded data. And here's, here's what we are trying to do. We're trying to say, say we're going to collect these two data together. We're going to say these are the valid data, they are invalid data. So you have binary data here. And we will see if this data can help you to do structure output predictions. Okay, here's my daughter again. And uh, she has some, she needs some help from you. And um, she is interested in indirect supervision. Okay, so the first question is here. On the left hand side, you have a car image. And you want to know where are the body, windows, and wheels. On the right hand side, you want to know is there a car in this image? So my question is, is there a connection between these two problems? Yeah, very close. So only a car image can contain car parts in the right precision. And a non-car image cannot have car parts in the right precision. So here's another example. So you, on the left-hand side, you want to know, given an English name entity and its Hebrew transliteration, what's the phonetic alignment? They say phonetic alignment is that the, first, the sound of the first character is equal to the sound of two Hebrew characters. Uh, Hebrew is from right to left, by the way. And, uh, uh, and uh, on the right hand side, we have a problem is uh, given one English nemity and one uh, Hebrew nemity, are these two nemity a transliteration pair? Okay. Uh, in, on the right hand side, the answer is no. And this is uh, um, the alignment. So, is there any connection between these two problems? And the answer is yes. Because only a translation pairs can have a good phonetic alignment. If, they, if a, if a non-translation pair, uh, and they have a good alignment, then it is not right, because if they have a good phonetic alignment, then they are translations. So the key intuition here is, for many structural output prediction tasks, you can find a companion binary task where uh, here is the decision problem. Prediction whether the input pro process, uh, process, processes a good structures or not. And why is this important? Because we're going to argue the binary label is a lot easier to obtain than the structure label data. And the question is how can we explore the relationship between these two problems? Okay, so first let me, let me show, convince you that the binary label is very easy to obtain. So in this example, uh, for the phonetic alignment, we hire a Hebrew expert. So he sit there one day, he go over the data set and annotate the alignment. On the right hand side, the binary la output label was uh, a binary label data set was collected by an American student who doesn't have n who doesn't have any idea of Hebrew. So the reason he can collect the binary label data is because he go to he went to Wikipedia for each English page he find the corresponding Hebrew page and he just generate positive example from that, and he generate negative example by rendering pair the, the, the name entities.
Okay, so as I say, the binary test is does this example process a good structures or not? So how can we formulate this idea? Okay, if this is a, a good structure, then it must exist a good structure that is to justify the positive label. And if this is not negative, it means that no matter how hard you try, you, can find a, you cannot find a good structure that is good enough. If uh, you pay attention to the second part of the talk, this is familiar, because we are going to use the same intuition here to see if we can use binary label data to help structures. OK, so here is the geometric interpretation again. So assuming this is, um, for a given example, this is uh, the feature vector for all possible structures, and this is a set. And let's say you use your favorite uh, structure learning prediction model over the label data, you, you find a, a weight vector here. And this is your prediction, because this is a point is the farthest along this direction. Geometrics, this is your prediction. And uh, however, the goal data is there. So the question is, why the binary label data can help you to correct your output, even though you don't know the goal label is there? OK, this is unlabeled data, so you don't know the goal data is on that corner. You only know that uh, you make the predictions. So let's say the, you put the negative data here. However, if, once you put the negative data here, this thing doesn't satisfy the constraint, where I say one positive example, one positive point need to be on the positive side, which is OK. But all the negative points need to be on the negative side. So if we have a negative data and we are lucky enough, in order to uh, make the line that satisfy the constraint, we need to rotate the line. And once we rotate the line, if we are lucky, we can make the correct predictions again. So I mentioned about two things. One is in the second part of the talk, where I say you want to find a hidden structure to help you to, to, to find the, the, uh, the binary output. But now I'm going to reverse the order. I'm going to say, can binary output problem help you to find a, a better structures? So in the, in the second part, the main focus is uh, binary output problems. And we don't have any label data for the structures. But now, the main focus is on the structure output problems. And want to see if binary output problems is, uh, is, can be helpful or not. So in this case, we have both structure label data and binary label data. Uh, so here is our formulation. Uh, we have the first thing is a regularization term. The second term is a direct revision, which is corresponding to the structure label data. The third term is related corresponding to binary label data. And the point is that we, we share the same W between the direct revision and indirect revision. So we can see if the indirect revision can help us to get a better weight vector or not. Optimize, optimization is similar to the one we use for uh, LCLR, but now we need to support uh, structure SVN because right now if you don't, have, you don't have the certain, then you are going back to the structure output SVN. So if you, you, if you don't know what is structure output SVN, it is the opposite of CRF. Sorry, I didn't explain anything. So what I'm saying is that uh, um, it's a learning algorithm that can do, help you to, to find our structures. And our learning code is available online. C1 and C2 here? Yeah. Uh, you have to tune them or? Yeah, you need to tune them on given the set. So we have three tasks. And um, we have uh, phonetic alignment, plus retaking, and uh, information extractions. And uh, for, the for the transliteration pair, as I told you, we collect the positive data from Wikipedia. We generate negative data by shuffling the pairs. Uh, for positive text sentence, we get the positive we get positive data from the, uh, from the English sentence, and we create negative data by just shuffling the word. So this is the figure of our result. This result is biased, because in this figure, we use very little structure label data. We use a lot of uh, binary label data. But in, in this settings, uh, we can get significant improvement if you use binary label data, because the binary label data can help you to find out the better structures. And here is a figure to, say, to show you that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, we fix an, the positive example, and we increase the number of negative examples along the way. And as we can see, if you add more and more negative, exam negative examples, you will get better and better results. And this is a crucial difference between the discriminative semi-supervised learning framework and our framework. Because usually, in a discriminative semi-supervised learning framework, people didn't use negative data. 
So what I'm trying to say is it is possible to use binary label data as indirect supervision to help structure output predictions. And our framework called JELIS and can gain from both direct supervision and indirect supervisions. So one interesting thing is that what happens if, if, if you don't have any um, don't, if you don't have any binary, uh, structural label data, basically then you should compare this framework to EM. And um, we did a preliminary result and uh, we've surprisingly we found that uh, if we don't have any um, label data, in fact our, our result is comparative to EM, sometimes it's better than EM. Okay. So, uh, so here is the last part of my talk is uh, want to use word response as indirect supervision. So let's go back to the first example where you want, you are, you are asking a coffee from Wally. And um, you want to know if this is good or bad. And the question is, can we use responses as a supervision signal? Okay, so here is the, the real problem we are trying to attack is called, this is a problem called semantic parsing. The problem is that in the input is what is the largest state that borders Texas? And the output, so the output is a mini representation which is largest state next to Texas, some logical ex uh, expression, such that in the, um, in the running time, you can translate this, this um, uh, logical expression into an SQL query, and then you can, collect the, you can query the database. So in our experiment, we have a database we have a translator that translates logical expression to a SQL query and want to see if we can get the answer. Okay, so the, we are not the first one who work on these problems, but the, all of the past works, they assume feedback at the mini representation levels. Basically, in the training data, they have questions and uh, the mini representation pairs, and it is very expensive to collect. So what we are trying to do is that we are trying to use indirect provision response as indirect supervision, and we think we can get these responses more easily. So what we're trying to do is we don't use any label mini representation, zero label uh, mini representations. We use the answer. The answer is New Mexico here. And uh, here's what we call the uh, response-driven learning. So we assume there's a teacher, that, and the teacher just stand there, and uh, you let the, your model run. So your model for each human response, a uh, human request, he will try to translate into some logical representation and we will try to query this representation into the database and then we will see if the answer match with the, 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 um, the, our answers or not. And if, if the um, answer is correct, we will say positive one. If the answer is wrong, we will say negative one. And the question is, can we just use this feedback to learn how to translate human uh, requests into some mini representations? So here is the diagram again. You have a mini representation as input. You predict, you try to predict into some mini representation. You apply to your database and you got the answer. You collect, you compare your answer to, and then you tell your model if this is correct or not. So here is how we evaluate it, okay? Oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you. So why do we believe this will work, okay? So, it, the answer is, uh, the intuition was very easy. The, the intuition is that if you got the answer correct, it doesn't guarantee, but it is very likely your mini representation have, is correct, okay? So we will boost straight from there. So our algorithm is very simple, is we will let the, the model run. And until that the model hit the first answer, we will let it keep running. And, but once it hit the correct answer, we will try to collect all the his mini representation and we're going to, uh, use this uh, mini representations and to improve our model, such that in the next time, we will make more predictions, we will find more correct answers for our database. You, you don't have any constraints at all. No, no, we have a lot of constraints. So we have constraints about uh, how do you, uh, so we, if you just let it run and you don't have any constraint, basically you, you can, it, it is not possible, you're going to find a logical representation. Yes. So the constraint here is, um, so this is a geo query domain, so this is a limited domain. Otherwise, this no, not possible to do this. Okay, so your, your constraint is, first of all, your output logical, need, logical expression need to be valid. Okay, and um, each one of these predicates can only map to one logical predicate. 
And uh, in the grammar, uh, they have, uh, they have uh, um, in the jQuery grammar, in the, in the grammar, they, they have some um, grammar rules about what can put on the largest. So you can only put state on largest, river on largest, but you cannot put people on the largest. So they are so all finite sets. They are all finite sets, right? Oh, okay. okay. No, they are finite sets, but they are a large number of finite okay. sets. Right. So um, I think this problem was coming from uh, a DAPA project many years ago about try to order a uh, booked air ticket online automatically, to translate human requests into, but that in that sense is also a very limited domain. So the, I think the biggest problem if you want to apply it on this on large domain is how to define the mini representation because I don't know how to define mini representation at that time. So here's the result. We have 250 um, training and answer pairs. We don't use any mini representations. And in a testing time, we have 250 queries and their answers. So we measure the accuracy by see how much, uh, what's the percentage we can get the answer correctly. Okay. So if you use supervised model, which you, you get all of the mini representations, you can get a uh, training error 87.6 and uh, 80.4 in the testing time, the accuracy. And, but our model, we, can, we get 82.4 and uh, 73.2 here. Okay, it is worse than supervised learning algorithm, but you need to remember we use zero mini representations. We just let the model run. So this result is not so bad. So other supervised models are ranging from 60% to 85% accuracy. Idea that how complicated this problem is because your predicates that they all all have rules. Right? So if you just enumerate all the possible combinations, it is not possible. <laughs> so uh, so we state is finite and the yes, the number of state the is finite. Of the, uh, yeah, okay, but uh, I can tell you we formulated this problem as uh, in linear integer programming, yeah. but we have thousands of variables. So right. Okay, so theoretically you are right. You can just keep trying until it hits, but uh, that, but, but, but. Uh, no, I just want to ask you. Wait, just have a rough idea. What is the perplexity of the problem? What is the perplexity of the yeah, problem? Yeah, all the combinations, if they are equal likely, the perplexity is highest, right? But a lot of combinations probably are more likely than others. So then. Um, I would say, uh, I'm not an expert of this because I, I implement this with my friend, but I think he told me that, um, uh, for one human query, one human query uh, even with all the constraints, you can still find 20 to 30 possible valid query okay. queries. Right. So it's, 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 it's not that easy. Okay. But I'm not so sure the number is correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I mean, part of, the point, part of the point of what you're trying to do is to try to make it easier to gather the supervision. Right. Labels, right. Right. But you, in this domain, do you think it's actually easier to provide the right answer than to provide the semantic parse? I think this is a very good question. I think for some cases it is not easy. For example, what is largest state border Nevada? I have no idea. Right. But uh, for some question, <laughs> for, for, for some question, it is easy for human to do that. Okay. So the interesting point here is that if you, we haven't done this experiment by the way, but if you start with those easy questions. Can it general to the hard questions as well? That's what we are trying. We think that's an important next step, but we don't know how to evaluate this now. So, <coughs> just wondering, suppose instead of a binary companion task, you had a, you had a, a task which gave you <coughs> a positive label, label, a negative label, or a don't know label. Huh. So I'm just wondering how that knowledge would affect your model and what, how that, that changed the characteristics of the solutions that you find. That is a very good question, and uh, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> because I, I don't know, but I know this has some uh, relationship maybe to reinforcement learning. So you can, think, you can broaden your question to say, I'm going to give you real value feedback. So your answer is 90% correct, I don't know. So, uh, so maybe you need to fix your model to do that. Right now, our, our model doesn't take advantage of any feedback other than binary. Because in the don't know case gets at the uncertainty of the, uh -huh. the label. Right? right. Right. But you can just ignore that don't know label. That's what we will do right now. <laughs> All right. So let me put it another way. So instead of getting a binary, definitely 
uh, minus one and positive one, yeah. you get an answer is a continuous number between minus one and one. Right. And from your formulation, it seems that you can still go through the minimization, you know, optimization problem and get something there. Are you? Yeah. No, so right now, we, our formulation doesn't allow you to do that. But we are trying to think, is there any way you can do, get partial feedback along the way? So right now, what we are trying to do is that we, we first, we only query the database un, until you finish translating the human query into a, a SQL queries, right? But uh, we are thinking, is, is it possible that you can just, you query the database before you finish the, the transformation to see if the partial translation is, is good enough or not? Well, well, that's the uh, mechanic. That's mechanical how you do the training. Right, right. But I'm asking the fundamental problem formulation problem. So uh, let's say that you, you ask people to tell them yes and no. Yeah. Right. But you know that some will click when they click yes, it's not hundred percent yes. Okay. Or when they click no, it's not hundred percent no. Okay. And so there is some you know probability distribution about when you mean yes you click on no, when you when you mean no you click on yes. Can your problem formulation be applicable to that kind of problem? Uh, right now, it will suffer. <laughs> because, yeah, sure, I mean. because right now, I just can't trust the feedback completely. But um, I think it is possible to, to, to adjust that, but I, I don't know okay. how good it is going to be. So recap. So first thing we talk about is constraint-driven learning is that can we use constraint to improve statistical model. And the second thing we talk about is we want to find the, the latent structures uh, with constraint uh, for the binary output problems. And in the third part, we're trying to see can we use binary supervision signal to improve structural output prediction learnings. And uh, in the final part, we're trying to learn with both responses. And some, uh, here's the last part of my talk, is uh, we, the, we are trying to encourage you to use indirect supervisions. Um, so there are many exciting new directions. One direction I'm particularly interested in is to use existing label data as an indirect supervision for other tasks. And uh, maybe you want to build a better interactive learning algorithm or want to use other indirect supervision forms. And we can think about uh, many other ways to do interest provisions. And thank you. So I'm happy to take any other questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so given that you're, you're solving this optimization problem with constraints, right. is it useful to do something of, you, you, now you can do a sensitivity analysis with constraints, right? Just, right. Is that, uh, we only do sensitivity analysis on uh, very small problems, and uh, it is clear some constraint is a lot more important than the other constraints. But uh, uh, we haven't did, uh, we haven't performed a serious analysis along these directions. But it's a good question. So the way you encode the constraints are really uh, treated that as hard constraints. So the, uh, using the internet programming to do that. No, you think IOP you can also encode as a soft constraint. It's trying to fit this edge yeah. the structure to match the constraint. So the edge, the choice of the edge is inherently soft. Right, but the, the constraint can be hard or soft. Yeah. All right. Thank you, the speaker. Thank you. Yeah.